Hello everyone and welcome to the first video in a new series on ecology, biodiversity and conservation. Uh, the reason for these videos is that I firmly believe the best way to get people passionate and engaged with conservation and biodiversity and ecology is to actually get you out there and seeing it and doing it for yourself. Um, unfortunately at the moment, um, for the past little while, that hasn't really been possible. So I'm hoping what I've got for you is the next best thing. What I'm going to be doing over the next few weeks is talking to various people around the world from places that I've visited, who I've met in various parts of the world, uh, who are passionate and enthusiastic and knowledgeable about their particular area of the world and their particular area of conservation. Okay, so I think this might give you the next best thing. The first talk, quite appropriately, is from the first expedition I ever led, which was to Madagascar. Now, Madagascar is, as you know, probably know, a biodiversity hotspot. It's incredibly important to the world's um, ecology, to the world's biodiversity, but it is also one of the world's poorest countries, and it is being massively ravaged and deforested, partly due to that, as you're going to hear. Okay. The speaker we've got today is a guy called Armand, who I met out there. He's going to describe a little bit more about that. And he is genuinely one of the happiest, most hopeful, most joyful people to talk to that you will ever come across. He is a true expert in Madagascan ecology and uh, the situation on the ground in Madagascar. And not only that, is he's doing this interview in his third language uh, after Malagasy and French. So. I sent him some questions uh, about the course that you're studying. Uh, I sent him some questions to, to try and research and answer. Uh, and then I had no idea of what he was going to come out with in this interview. And the quantity of information I got was absolutely huge. The detail and the quantity, and the quality of the information was absolutely enormous. So this is an edited version of our conversation. Um, essentially, I was desperately trying to keep up with what he was saying and make sure that I could pick out the bits that would uh, fit your syllabus the most closely. Okay, um, I've used some photos and some diagrams to help illustrate what Armand is talking about. Uh, where possible, in most cases, they are my own photos from Madagascar, uh, not necessarily from exactly the places he's talking about. And uh, in some cases where he's talking about a particular ecological technique, I've used photos from other expeditions, so uh, they may not be from Madagascar, but they illustrate the same uh, technique. Now, he also uh, spoke about a lot, a lot of fascinating things um, that were not directly related to the syllabus, and I just had to take those out to put in a separate video because otherwise you'd have been here for over an hour. Uh, but I do highly, highly recommend a bonus video I'm going to put together where we talk about his involvement with uh, women's groups in STEM in, uh, in and around Africa, um, his uh, approach to um, his feelings on renewable energy and what could make Madagascar move to a more sustainable future, um, his thoughts on the UK, which he visited in 2018. So if you ever want to see your own country through somebody else's eyes, I strongly recommend you listen to that. You'll never look at castles and the National Trust the same way again. And also, we're going to talk about our, uh, our, our NGO that we're allegedly going to be setting up in the future. Okay. Now, where he's talking about charities, non-government organisations, I have put uh, their banner, their name, their links in the video. All these organisations largely are voluntarily funded. So if you felt the need to look them up and to donate any money to them, they are all doing fantastic work uh, to further conservation and protection of biodiversity in Madagascar. So I think you're in for a real treat here. Enjoy. Hello, Armand. How are you doing? Are you all right? Yes, uh, I am fine. OK, yes. so thank you for thank you for doing this interview. Could you start by uh, introducing yourself and explain a little bit about where you are and what your your job in Madagascar will be and, and explain everyone why we're talking? How, how did we met? How do we meet? Thank you very much, Charles. Um, I'm so happy to be part of this because I know students really need uh, some help, especially at this hard time. So my name is Armand Rakutnuweli Naifsong. It's quite long, but it's a Malagasy name. I'm 52 years old. I'm from Madagascar. I live in the capital of Antananarivo. Uh, I'm a tour guide, a tour leader, and also a translator, interpreter sometime. I used to be a teacher before, long time ago in the past. Yeah. 
but now I'm full time to guide, to leader. I love nature, wildlife, and I love traveling. And also I appreciate continuous learning in life. I never stop studying. Yeah. Um, I went back to the university at the age of 36 for my English degree in Antananarivo, in our um, public university, which is also good. But before, yeah, so I first uh, met uh, you in 2012. I think yeah. you still remember that. That's correct, 2012. It's yeah. Very fresh. It's still very fresh when you accompanied your um, uh, students yeah, in the forest and in the marine side. I still remember that very fresh in my, uh, in my memory. Yeah, me too, me too. Uh, <laughs> so that was also a very good, uh, very good time. Um, and also, I met you also when I went to the UK two years ago in 2018. Yeah, which was uh, just for just for, uh, for an afternoon tea, I think. Yes, which was <laughs> fast. We introduced you to, introduced you to the uh, to the British concept of the pub. Um, yes, is... I love I love that I love that. We will talk more about that later. Yeah, on we'll because... talk about that a bit later on. So. <laughs> So first, so first proper question, I guess, is why, can you explain to everybody why it is that Madagascar is so important in terms of its wildlife, its environment? What, what's so special about Madagascar? Because it is a really special place. That's a very good question. Thank you, Charles. Yeah, you know that Madagascar is um, an island. Yeah, it's like the UK. There are so many advantages of being an island. And it's the fourth biggest island in the world just after Greenland, Papua New Guinea, and Borneo. <clears throat> it is so big. Yeah, two and a half uh, the size of the UK. And it looks like a big uh, left foot. <laughs> big <laughs> nearly, left foot. Okay. One, yes, big left foot. Yeah, nearly 1,000 miles long. And also uh, 350 miles uh, wide, and also 250 miles of the coast of uh, Africa, Mozambique. Yeah. From the geological point of view, yeah, it is also very important because there was a continental drift yeah, about 200 millions of years ago. If you remember the Gondwana, yeah. the Gondwana was one mass uh, continent uh, combining Madagascar, Africa, South America, India, Australia, and Antarctica. Then the split of uh, Madagascar and Africa, 70 millions of years ago, 70 millions. Yeah. And that helped, that helped Madagascar to, to keep yeah, without any uh, big predators, their wildlife and their nature. Yeah. And Madagascar yeah. was covered by forest at that time. Yes. So especially the lemurs, um, the, the, the big birds that we call the elephant birds at that time were still there, the big lemurs. Some of them got extinct, but yeah, we still have some lemurs. Yeah. Uh, before the arrival of the human beings, so many uh, special um, fauna and flora in Madagascar. I think you have also a reference of um, David and Tumbra in Madagascar. Yes, you yes. have so many programs on that. Yeah. So it's not new to you. Um, that's why Madagascar was very, very uh, important in terms of uh, wildlife and environment. That's obviously, you know, why why it's really important place. That that isolation means it's entirely unique, isn't it? This is the wildlife yes. there. You don't find it anywhere else. But obviously, it's yes. not. It's got it's got people. It's got humans now. Uh, didn't have those seventy million years ago. So, in in your travels around Madagascar. Uh, you've probably seen quite a lot of human impacts, a lot of farming, a lot of agriculture. Can you give us some examples? Because our students are expected to know the conflict between farming and, and conservation. Can you give us some examples of where they've come into conflict and maybe where they've worked well together? Charles, yes, that is a very, very important question because <clears throat> sometimes it's very hard to combine because one can harm the other. Yeah. And there is no place for the other two if one is dominant. Okay. But I have uh, got some examples here. I have seen in Madagascar, for instance, uh, the slush and burn agriculture. Right. That's uh, a kind of uh, form of conflict between 
farm, farming and conservation, because um, uh, from the beginning, <coughs> Madagascar, the first settlers, they didn't uh, till the land. So they just relied on slash and burn agriculture okay. by cutting, uh, cutting the trees and then uh, uh, sowing the seeds and then harvesting, which was very, very um, um, bad for the forests. And that's why we lost almost 8% of our uh, primary forests now. 80%? 80 percent Wow. That's wow. very, very big. So slash and burn agriculture, the bushfire, the bushfire in the south of Madagascar for cattle grazing. You know yeah. that uh, in, in the south, it's, um, it's going to become a desert because people continuously burn the forest, burn the, the land, the grass, yeah. without realizing that it's very bad. And also uh, the use of protected areas. In Madagascar, we have got so many protected areas where local people plant vanilla. Mm. They use the um, liana and creepers. They, wow. they leave the big trees, but they use those creepers for uh, the vanilla because the vanilla, they need plant supporters. Okay. So in terms of, in terms of um, farming, there are a lot too, but um, they went too far. So they occupy all the land, even the suppose protected areas are uh, abused and used. Yeah. But so at the same time, the, the, the creepers, they cannot live with the with the, the vanilla. So they have to kill the, the creepers so okay. as to give uh, space to the vanilla to right. have more production. But vanilla also is very important in Madagascar yeah. as it is uh, giving them a lot of uh, foreign money by okay. exporting. Yeah, yes. it's, the, it's the best I, in the world, the Madagascan vanilla. It's the, yes. it's the very best that there is. So yeah, I, I think yes, I, under, that's I, true. I understand now. The creepers are obviously very important and getting rid of them to grow vanilla help, harms the forests. Yes. Yeah. Okay, yes. I, I'm with you. So, well, and also in the highland, also we, we have uh, uh, some people um, uh, using fertilizers and chemicals mm. which make the soil uh, harder and the, consequently the soil becomes uh, barren. Okay. Yeah, I don't know how that is, but um, yeah, I have seen that also so many times because I used to live in the highlands. Yeah. So we we didn't uh, use fertilizers and chemicals anymore. Um, okay, so that's, the second, that stopped, uh, is it? So that, that yes. stopped in the highlands. Okay, that, that's positive. Yeah. So now people start using... Uh, uh, compost heap, mm -hmm. something like that, which is bio, but it's not enough anyway. So scientists are trying also to make uh, some research how to improve the fertilizers if it yeah. is needed. We will talk more about that later on with the, the help. But yeah. the farming and conservation that can work uh, well together. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. People are using nowadays the, the, the bats poo. You know that here we yeah, have okay. bats. Yeah? yeah, yeah. Yeah, we have got bats. We have got uh, two species, insect bats and uh, the flying fox, the fruit bats. Okay. So we we, we uh, protect them, but at the same time, we collect, we collect I mean, the scientists, they collect the, their poo All right, and okay. turn it into fertilizer. And people are using it because it's very, very good for the production. Yeah. So that's also... Um, something very good and the name is guano mat guano, guano yeah. mat it's high yeah, in guano, very, high, Madagascar. very high in nitrogen and phosphorus isn't it that's the yes that's the kind of fertilizer yes. yeah okay so, so so that's that's a sustainable way to produce fertilizers to grow and that works with conservation yes that works yeah. very well also some examples with um uh ngos yeah and the ngos, NGOs yeah. are also um, a kind of uh, catalyst between the farmers and the conservationists. Yeah. yeah. We have got so many NGOs here, but just to give you um, just a few to, example. Just to explain, I think that's uh, for those students that don't know, that's a non-government organization, yeah? Yes, and, that's and, it. And where are, these people, right. where are these people coming from? Are they Malagasy? Are they um, international? Are they... They, are, they are international. Right. Yeah, I've, I've got some examples here, like the Missouri Botanical Garden. Right. They are doing 
very fine since 2006, especially in the north and in the southeast of Madagascar. Okay. In the southeast of Madagascar, a place called um, um, Mahabu Mananivu. Yeah. Mahabu Mananivu. If you look at the map, you can see the river. It's, there is a river called Mananivu. Yeah. And it is a kind of uh, swamp where they help the local people to um, plant more of um, uh, thin grass. Yeah. Thin grass that we, we call harifu to make hats, mats, baskets, yeah. even sometimes uh, clothing because that is their traditional clothing and helping that that uh, NGO is helping the, the rural people to produce more so that they cannot uh, uh, use the forest. Yes. So they, they cannot destroy the forest. And until now, they are still doing fine because this NGO also is looking for um, partnership from abroad okay. to buy the handicrafts and it is best selling right. for money and protecting the environment and also helping the people to have a sustainable activity during the year. Brilliant. That's one example. And the same NGO also is helping the north in the same place in a, a Ambalabi village in uh, Zahamena. Mm -hmm. It's a uh, center east of Madagascar, where the people plant vegetables. Right. Yeah, it's, it's near the forest, the National Park of Sahamena, but the NGO is giving them um, a chance of planting different types of vegetables so that the vegetables can be spread out all over the country for use, local use. That's yeah. really good. Yeah. It's very, very good. And there is also another one. Um, I, I have already worked with this one recently in last uh, September last year. Yeah. A sweet Swiss um, uh, NGO called Helvetas. Helvetas, Helvetas okay. from Switzerland. Yeah, it gives uh, um, uh, clean water for the population. But at that time, um, we visited the agroforestry in Ambanda. You remember from Ambanda to Ankifi? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. the long if drive, yeah. The board, there, there is the, the forest there, Yes. agroforestry, where they plant uh, cocoa, cocoa yeah. plantation, which is very good for chocolate. Yes. And also um, they need the shade. Yeah, they still have the big trees, but they, at the same time, they have got cocoa plantation, oh, okay. coffee, um, cinnamon, green pepper, and Elvetas is helping them in that area so they to manage very well their production so they're putting you know useful plants for growing produce in amongst existing forest yes and that obviously maintains the biodiversity and keeps the yeah that's, yes. that's clever I, okay that's that that's that you, you've pretty much answered uh, the next couple of my questions there which are what have you seen that farmers and conservationists can do to work better together so we've got using animal produce like the guano to, to replace fertilizers yes. we've got yes. um, agroforestry so we've got yes. mixing in useful crop plants with trees yes. natural trees to keep that diversity up uh, you've got vegetable growing uh, redu reduced reduced high intensity farming in the highlands um, yes. these are all perfect examples and exactly the kind of things that could come up on my students exams and my students syllabus um, so I guess the next thing is is about your your job particularly which goes on to um can you what what projects have you been directly involved with while while working in conservation and specifically our students are asked to know about data gathering they're asked to know about the research they're asked to know about data gathering and surveying you know when they're asked to go out and gather data for their a levels in the real world where does that data go what's that data used for sometimes they stay in the forest and uh uh, trap some moss lemurs, and then yeah. after that they collect some samples from those moss lemurs before releasing them. So they're trapping. What what samples are they collecting from them? So this is something we have to know about: is is humane trapping. So presumably they've got little humane traps with little doors. What are they doing yes. with the mouse lemurs before they release them? So, what are they? Yeah, they they take them, they measure them, they take some samples, there's some uh, blood sample or okay. the fur. Yeah. or something like that. 
the poo or even the ticks if they have got any ticks any uh it's more ticks. insects in wow. there they're yeah. looking at parasites on mouse lemurs yeah parasites oh, yeah cool. so collecting all these and it's not just for uh, one time but so many times yeah but they release yeah. and they also count the number of uh, trapped mouse lemurs they tag them some time yeah by um putting something on the um taking uh, some pieces of the the year and then if they notice that it has been uh, trapped for um the second time or third time yeah and also to know the population the number of uh, approximate which, number of population in one area which is an example of what we would call mark release recapture which is exactly on our on our syllabus it's a you know that the maths our students have to know how to do that so that's real life example of mark release recapture okay so they're giving giving mouse, le mouse lemurs get earrings excellent yes earrings <laughs> yeah uh not only the mouse lemurs but also uh snakes um yeah. um leaf-tailed gecko uh anything maybe insects yeah birds or so yeah with the mist net birds yeah where they, netting, um, yeah. yes mist netting where they um they they put a trap with a net and collect and uh, helping the students also how to take them out of the net do you know what happens to the to all the data do you know what happens so they gather all the data mark release recapture do you know what happens i mean is it used to persuade the Malagasy government to protect areas? Is it used, you know, yes. in, in other countries? Uh, it, works in, it works in both ways because most of the scientists are from, um, from abroad mm -hmm. internationally. From the so UK. they take the sample and make some study also in their laboratory abroad yeah. to, um, to look what is needed for the future and also to to give report to the mi different ministries in Madagascar, the mm -hmm. scientists, so that they are aware what is going on to improve yeah. and also to protect more seriously what is left. Because losing 80% of the forest, losing um, the, the, the lemurs or any other special species which were unique, that's very bad if we still continue losing them. Yeah. So we need to protect we need action. So the action must be from the government, from the scientists, from students, from local people, from everybody. And we can uh, enjoy afterwards the beautiful green forest and green area. Yeah, that, that, that's a really important point. It, it actually leads perfectly into the next one. I mean, I, I've heard, I don't know if you can tell me if this is true or not, that the, uh, the Matsudroy camp where we stayed first the forest around there has been has largely disappeared since we were there an <clears> awful <throat> lot. Why, why, in your experience, is it that you think that local people damage their own environments? I mean, why would because the local people presumably enjoy their forests as well, but why do you think the local people then cut them down? Because it's just one place that we visited, Machedrui, but it's everywhere in Madagascar. Mm. Yeah. It's um, it's has become a very big problem nowadays because um, um, people are so desperate sometimes. There are so many reasons, but let me just point out one, and then I will continue with the others. Poverty. Yeah. Poverty and lack of education. So they can go together. They can go together to explain that people cannot grasp the importance of what they have, where they are. So they, yeah. they um, if, if they don't have the right information or if they don't have the capacity of um, understanding yeah, the message from the scientists, they will never understand and they will continue. There is also the bad tradition, bad habit. In the West, people have been using palisandro trees for uh, charcoal and for firewood and yeah. for house building. In the past, there were so many, but now they have been reduced and people still continue because they said that what has been done is good. Their ancestors have been um, cutting down trees and they still continue without thinking that it can damage the future. So there are still, um, people, there are still people who don't believe that the forests will ever disappear, that just think they can yes. carry on. Wow. Yes, so, so many people still believe in that it is still there. 
so we can still carry on. Um, there is also um, the population growth, which is yeah. also another factor that pushes people to damage a lot of their environment. So once they um, damage one place, yeah, and they also um, grow in number, then they move to another place and continuously damaging the other places, which is very, very bad. Yeah. Now, fortunately, nowadays we have got uh, um, so many um, different uh, uh, activities carried on to help people to stop cutting down trees. Yeah. Um, because um, learned people, educated people scattered around, sent by the ministries and helping them to make something to stop cutting trees. You know also that we have uh, only one way of uh, cooking here by cutting down trees um, and yeah. using firewood and charcoal. So that is yeah. also another problem. Sometimes also people are very uh, angry towards the authorities because where they lived before in the national parks, in the, the forest, and mm -hmm. once the government established the forest as national park, they were kicked out. In the okay. beginning, they were given some, um, some money and some land to kill, but now it has stopped. The 50% so of the ent entrance fees from the visitors went to local developments, yeah. local projects. But that was in the past. But since uh, 2015, I think, yeah, five years ago, they have stopped giving so they, the local. So they're just kicking. Become, they're just kicking people yeah. out and just saying no. Yeah. This is a national park and giving them nowhere to go. Yes. Wow. And people are very angry. And sometimes the example of Ankara Fans, for instance, where mm. we camped from yeah. Mariaran, we camped, and yeah. these people over there, they were angry because they were not given any land. They were not allowed to use the forest anymore. They had been using, and sometimes they are angry and they burn. They, they burn. They were set fires and burn. Yes, yes. Wow. They set fire in the national park, which is very bad. So it's um, just a list of examples to tell you that uh, um, people damage their own environment, sometimes deliberately, Sometimes not because they want it, but they were likely forced to. So the only solution nowadays is to make them aware that they are part of the environment, give them a chance to use one part, and then they become also agent of the protection of yeah. the area. So that, that leads perfectly into the next question, which is what's the most successful form of conservation for Madagascar? And I guess we're going to talk about people, you know, and getting people engaged. Yes, that's a very good uh, question related to the first one. Yeah. Um, it's, um, I, I've, I've seen two uh, forms very successful. The first one is participative con con conservation. Right. Participative conservation um, that will allow the local people, the local community to be creative within the group. Um, to let them discover by themselves the advantages of protecting their own environment and then train them to be able to manage it. One example is in the south of Madagascar, a place called Anza Reserve. Yes. Remember, maybe one day if you come back, I will lead you to that place. That's very, very good. Um, the villagers, they saw uh, ring some ring-tailed lemurs in that area. Yeah started to protect them. They did not feed them, but they prote protected them, and it has become a special reserve accessible for visitors, locals, and foreigners, both, since 1999. And they um, protected the area. They trained their young lads to become uh, local guides, yeah. and they did very well. And also we ourselves as national tour guides, we help them also. In the beginning, they were not able to speak English. So they spoke Malagas and we spoke English and we helped them explaining what uh, had been done and what's going on. And uh, Madagascar has got this as a, 
the national symbol, the ring tail limousine. Yes. And foreigners were very happy to visit that. So, so many visitors going to the south, national, and the place is um, um, mountainous with some rocks yeah. and some vegetation for the limous to, to, to eat and to have shelter. And it's very difficult to set on fire on. Oh, so okay. it's well, it's well, uh, well located mm. where the lemurs can live freely. Nobody can harm them. Yeah, there are also some uh, predators, natural predators, the, the fusa and yeah. uh, the, 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 the two boas, grand boas, the snakes. Yeah, so the, the, for those people who haven't heard of a, of a fusa, it's like a big, it's the Madagascar's predatory cat, isn't it? It's a bit like a small yes. puma or a small leopard or, or something like that. Yes, but, it's like a puma, uh, a small like a puma. puma. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, they're, so, they're very endangered, aren't they? There's very, very few of those left. Yes, oh. yes, unfortunately, but um, they they are left in the the primary forest, so they the, the people cannot see them often. Yeah, and also the the last one is and it's the national parks creation. Yeah, created the national parks with the um, different research centers. One example is in Ranmafana. Yeah. where we have got the Valbio Center. Valbio Center is at the same time um, uh, giving a chance for that rainforest to be protected and for uh, carry on some uh, different research. And also uh, some volunteers coming around to help the local people and all the projects benefiting the local people. So they have got so many diverse projects there. So, so what? So what? I'm, what I'm hearing basically is is something I've heard the world over is that you don't do good conservation without involving local people. It's not possible. All good conservation, in your experience, involves local people and involves, you know, wealth, education, jobs, and then yes. the conservation comes. Yes, that's that's the best way. Because right. the local people, so they know the secret. They know yeah. the secret of the place, so they can give you some, uh, some, uh, some of the secrets if uh, if you uh, uh, let them participate. Yeah. Because um, I don't know if you know about this. Most of those um, unique, um, unique flora in yeah. Madagascar, ninety or eighty percent are medicinal have medicinal values. They do, which yeah. is very yeah. good. So it's very good to preserve them because we may need them. Well, so most most pharmaceuticals are plant derived, and a lot of the ones we use in in stuff even like cancer therapy come from the Madagascan periwinkle, various other Madagascan species. So yes. on on the forests and that natural pharmacy, then the next question is: in these good examples that you've seen, have you seen any? Uh, forest area recover because something our students have to talk about is succession the natural progression from damaged land up to, back up to the full climax community have you, have you seen any uh, scenarios where the forests have actually grown back a bit that's a very very important question because um, if you talk about the rainforest and the people had been using slash and burn agriculture in the past yeah, once it was damaged, it was demolished, it will never come back to the normal again. Or if you want it to get back, then you need about one century at least to A get century. it uh, recovered. Wow. Yeah, one century at least. So, yeah, look at, um, if you look at the reality, it's not possible. But in some places, I had already seen, in some places where they, um, make some project of uh, bringing back the forest. Mm. That's also um, uh, one of the aim of the biodiversity partnership in Tianzafatu, where they, uh, they plant trees, yeah, the, the native trees, uh, endemic species of trees only in that area to uh, make a kind of, to link the corridor of the lemurs. So the project was, um, in the beginning to to have a look at the lemurs and to observe what they eat 
the bamboo lemurs, the black and white draft lemurs, the eye eye. So they are concentrating on these three species nowadays, and they plant some trees. Yeah, where yeah. they motivate also the local people to um, to follow the project, and it's a very successful since uh, 2006 or 2009 reforestation um, or uh, creating forest corridor. The 50% yes. of um, permanent forest nature, 25% um, of um, um, wood that can be used for fuel and uh, house, house building for local use, yeah. and 25% of planting fruit trees also used by the local people so yeah. it's at the same time bringing back slowly the natural forest and giving a chance for the people to make use of uh, some wood without yeah. uh, destroying it completely sustainable so forestry brilliant i i like i like it very much it so I mean, I guess yes, the, I guess the the next thing is that you you've kind of answered about balancing needs of people with conservation, give us a really good understanding of the the problems and some of the conservation solutions in Madagascar. I guess <laughs> we come to the last thing. Is there anything else? Because this is going to go out to to my students um, in the UK and their A level students. They're going to go off to do degrees. I hope some of them are going to go and do some biology, right? Um, they're going to go off and do various different courses and then they're going to be entering the world of work and you know hopefully maybe this will even be seen by people outside of my students um, and what would you like them to know have you got any further last messages or stories for them <coughs> I have so many messages but uh, maybe um, uh, a word of encouragement now they are still students they will not stay students uh, for life, but later on they will be um, uh, integrating in um, daily life, in work and uh, uh, family life and so on. So as they are still students, I would give them the message to study well, to try to, um, to keep that uh, advantage while your parents are still uh, having the possibility of sending you to school, do your best and never give up yeah yeah there will be there will be a wave of failure and uh, success but that's life so keep it up be courageous help one another be the best and shine yeah so so the the the, the family and the nation and the world waiting for you to contribute or so in your turn what you have gained because the parents and the wealth have given to you. So it's your turn later on to give or so and get prepared to that. But for now, concentrate on what is now and think about aim higher about the future. So never Wait. stay at the last, but be on the top all the time. And Life would, is like a competition. I would like, I'd just like to say for the benefit of those people watching, you've inadvertently literally just said my job title there in terms of talking about aim high, uh, you know, that, that I haven't primed you to say that, have I? I didn't, I didn't tell you that beforehand. That's just a, a, a lucky coincidence. <laughs> I, I, I like that, um, uh, Charles, because when you aim higher, then you get nearly to the top, even if you don't get the top, but your aim is to get to the top. And it's possible to get to the top because you are smart. The students are smart. So tell your students they are smart and they can aim higher. And they can also follow your example and even beyond you, better Absolutely. than you. And that's what we wish to our students to be better than we are because life is evolving. Life is going better and better. So I wish them the best. Tell them that I'm always with them. Yeah, I think of them, I love them, and I want them to be the best. Brilliant. There, thank you. There are so many assemblies in what you've just said, and I'm sure I'll be using this clip for many years to come. So Very much yeah. indeed. So yeah. thank, you, thank you so much for that, Armand. That's really, really helpful. So hope you enjoyed that. 
What a guy, eh? I do recommend that you look up the NGOs that we're talking about in there. They're all doing fantastic work in Madagascar in terms of biodiversity and conservation. And I strongly recommend you watch the other video that's going to be coming out uh, where we discuss some things not strictly related to the A-level syllabus. But if you ever want to see your country through somebody else's eyes and never look at castles, pubs, solar panels, um, the same again, I do recommend you watch that as well as if you're interested in um, women's groups and work with them in, uh, in Africa and uh, our new NGO that apparently we're setting up as a result of the conversation. So massive thanks as well to Operation Wallacea for helping me put these interviews together. Um, they were the group we initially went to Madagascar with and without them I would not have met Armand. And for the next interview we're taking you all the way over to Toronto in Canada to talk about forestry and conservation in North America. Okay, so look forward to that.